All right, Luke 835, we'll quote it together uh, collectively. Thank you, sir. Uh, and then uh, we will quote that. I'll let you quote it individually. So if you need to get your Bibles open to Luke uh, 835. Uh, and uh, in your books, we're going to be on page 30, what page is it here? 35, 36. 36 in your book. So page 36 in your book. And then Luke 835. So if you've got your... Your Bible's open. We're going to go in there, and then we'll talk about a few things here. Again, uh, the whole goal of what we're doing here, modesty and appropriateness, is uh, this uh, lesson four. It's all about being modest and appropriate, but uh, the, the overall concept is that we're being different by design. Uh, God wants us to be different. Uh, he made us different. He created us different. Uh, ladies are different from guys, and guys are different from ladies. Amen? And uh, so that is one thing that we have to uh, recognize. I've got this book that I'm reading through and it talks about uh, everything that uh, wives wish their husbands knew about them. And they, they talk about the differences in travel and uh, how ladies are, are, are more prone to relationships and intimacy and men are more goal oriented and getting to the point, you know. And uh, I noticed going down to San Diego, uh, can we go to potty, you know, and everybody wants to get out and look at this and look at this. I'm looking at the clock. We need to get back in there so we can get down there. And uh, you just see the difference in people. The ladies want to casually walk around, look at this and look at that. Ooh, look at the birds and look at the trees. I'm like, look at the time. Amen. We got to get back in this car and get to San Diego. And it's just a difference. Why? Uh, the ladies are different than guys. Uh, they're, they're, they're not built like us. And you know, if you're not careful, you can forget that we're different by design and you can get frustrated with that and, uh, you know, and, and kind of ruin the trip. You know, it's all about a clock. You got to beat the clock. Got to get to San Diego for the traffic. Got to do this. Got to do this. Like, well, how about have some fun? Let's relax a little bit. Let's sit down. Let's see something. Amen. Okay, we saw the road. Now let's go. Amen. So uh, just uh, the differences. Amen. And that's what this book is talking about. We're different. And we've got to let Christ uh, bring out those differences by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and be uh, what God wanted us to be and, and, and embrace the role that God has for us. Amen. And uh, so I, I got a taste of that going down. So I try to be more relaxed going Going to San Diego uh, since I wasn't under the gun and under the clock, amen. But you still have that in you. It's just, it's a part of us, Sarah. It's just fair, you know. And I'm not saying all guys are like that, uh, but most guys are, amen. And I'm not saying all ladies are like that, but most ladies are. Uh, more relationship oriented and seeing things of that nature. Right, we're different, and that's what this whole study is about. Uh, but let's go ahead and pray, and we'll look at some of these verses here. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace, and uh, Lord, thank you for this study that we can look at and see how we definitely are different by design. You've not made men and women uh, the same for a purpose and for a reason. Help us to embrace the roles that you've given us to operate in that role and allow the Holy Spirit to have liberty in our lives, Lord, that we may understand the functionality of men and women and femininity and, uh, Lord, the masculinity that you've given us, and may we be a blessing and encouragement that others may see Christ in us, the hope of glory that they might be saved, Lord, by that which we do. Lord, ultimately, that's what this is all about, is showing Christ in our life and how He makes a difference by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. And lead in our discussion this morning. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's read uh, or, uh, Luke 8.35 here. Uh, some of you can probably quote this already, and we'll let you do that. Amen. Luke 8.35. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Luke 8.35. All right, so who wants to get, get a stab at saying that? Yes, Ms. Dawson. And they were afraid. They were afraid. Amen. 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 Good job. Amen. All right, who else? That's, that's a mouthful. Amen. Katie? Amen. Amen. I saw another hand. Yes, sir. Thank <laughs> you. 
Amen. Amen. See what happens when you get saved. Folks get afraid of you. Amen. Yes, Lily. Amen. Good job. Amen. Uh, yes, Mark. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Do that one. Jeff, you got your hand up or you scratching your head? Go ahead. Amen. Good job, Jeff. Good job. Amen. Anybody else? Okay, let's read it together again. Luke 8, 35. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Luke 8, 35. Amen. Let's set the context here because if you're looking in your book here, we're at uh, page 35, 36. Let me give you that blank there. Uh, and it says, the way you dress should lead others to respect you more. The way you dress, dress should lead others to respect you more. Okay, and let's look at the context behind uh, this passage of scripture and why this particular passage is used for this question. Okay, notice what it says here. The way you dress, you lead others to respect you more. Set the context here. Here was a man here in chapter number eight who previously was in the tombs. He was possessed of devils and uh, he had a legion in him, which means there were many devils there. Uh, he came to Jesus and uh, Jesus cast the devils out. And there's, there's a change in him now. Amen. And that is parallel to a person getting saved. Amen. Uh, before you and I got saved, we had the demonic influence in our lives. Some probably were possessed, maybe, maybe others were not, I don't know. Uh, but we had that influence in our life. Uh, no different here. Notice what happens here when, when uh, Jesus cast the devil out. Come down here to verse number uh, oh, 30. Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? He said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. They besought him that they would not command them to go into the deep. And when he says, uh, don't go into the deep, what, what, what deep? Is he talking about deep water? Yes, yeah, Sarah's. Bottomless pit or the place where certain demonic angels are confined presently. Amen. And so he says, we don't want to go there. And uh, there, uh, and notice it, verse 32, and there was there and heard of, uh, of many swine feeding on the mountain. They besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them and he suffered them. Suffered there means to permit or allow. He permitted them or allowed them. Uh, of course, then the devils, uh, then went the devils out of the man and into the swine and the herd violently ran down a steep place into the lake and were choked. So they still had to go someplace else. Anyway, uh, when, now that, that's a shame when even the pigs don't want devils. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's a shame when the devils, uh, the pigs don't want devils and, and pigs are pretty dirty. Uh, when they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Now, verse 35, here's our context here. Then they went out to see what was done. Who is the they that went out to see what was done? Katie? Okay. Exactly, exactly. There was a group that saw what was done. They went back into the city, told them what happened, and all those folks from the city uh, with these other folks came out to see what was done, okay? Uh, they wanted to see this man that was previously what? 
crazy or possessed. How, how many of y'all come from a hometown where there was a person that everybody knew about that was crazy or did something and, and everybody, you gotta see this guy. Most, most, if you're from a small town, most small towns had that guy, you know, a drunk Bob or, you know, you know, Betty Boop over here or whatever. Everybody had one of those people that everybody went out to see, uh, especially if something dramatically happened to change their life. Okay, everybody knew about them. Uh, they went out to see what was done. And uh, notice this, I find this interesting. Where did they go when they came? According to scripture, where did they go? They came to Jesus, okay? They went out to this privileged possessed man and they came back and they came to Jesus, okay? And what did they find? They found the man out of whom the devils were departed, okay? So they went out to Jesus first and they saw the man second. Oftentimes, uh, when I first got saved, people came to me first. What do you think they came second? The preacher. What'd you do to that boy? That's what they wanted to say. They would come and they would say, uh, we see he changed. What did you do to him? They're like, I just preached the gospel. I didn't do anything to him. Amen. Uh, so they came. They came to Jesus. They found the man out of whom the devils were departed. He's not uh, possessed anymore. Amen. The possession of the devils is gone. And uh, he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, that is contrary to what he was before. What was he before? Run around the tombs. They couldn't chain him. They couldn't bind him. They couldn't do anything with him. And so they left him out in the tombs. Uh, why did they leave him in the tombs? Wouldn't hurt anybody. Who hangs out in tombs? Nobody. Dead people, amen. So it's a good place to be in the tomb. So you don't bother anybody. You don't want to be in, be in the city with everybody. The lepers didn't even want him, amen. Uh, so he's in the tomb where nobody is at, amen. Uh, believe it or not, he's probably in good company. <laughs> okay, so he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, amen. And then notice this. Uh, he, he's, he's got Jesus there now. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, what is that a representation of? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, yes. Humility. Learn, be taught. Who else in the Bible sat at the feet of Jesus? Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. And it said, hearing his words. So it denotes that he is wanting to learn. He's wanting to study, wanting to be discipled. He's wanting to, to get it. And by the way, that goes hand in hand with salvation. You give me somebody that got saved recently, they should want to learn about what they have. I wasn't the brightest kid on the block. I wasn't the most studious kid on the block. But when I got saved, I wanted to know what I had. Amen. It's just like getting a VCR. It's just like getting a uh, HD TV. It's like getting a, one of those expensive cameras. It's like getting a big, nice keyboard. When you get something, it comes with instructions. You want to know how to use it. And when I got saved, I wanted to know, what is this all about? I'm different. I'm changed. I don't see things the same. What, can somebody help me? Discipleship. Amen, Delmer? <laughs> That's what it's all about. Amen. Somebody help me with this. Amen. I got Shariah back there. Discipleship. Amen, Shariah? Amen. Somebody show me what this is all about. So he's changed here. He's uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And notice what else changed with him. He's dressed. What connotation does that send to us? That there is a dress of the world yes, and there is a dress of the witnessing Christian. There is a difference. There is a difference. If you come back up to 27, and when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and what? And wear no clothes. He wear no clothes. So there is a difference. Neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When Jesus came into his life, amen, he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. He's clothed and in his right mind. What does that tell you about his previous mind? It wasn't his right mind. I say this oftentimes, and I think we often say this too, and we take it for granted. People that do these heinous crimes and commit these sins, and, and we say they must not have been in their right mind. They aren't. They aren't. A right mind is obeying the Ten Commandments. That's a right mind. Yes, sir. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. That's a right mind. So when I commit those acts, guess what? I'm really not in my right mind. I'm in a sinful mind. A right mind wants to follow Christ and do God's will. So now he's contrary to where he was at before. He's wanting to do that. Uh, said he's in his right mind, and they were afraid. 
That word afraid there is not the word that means to fear or to be scared of. It means to revere or to be in awe of. I guarantee you when you got saved and went back to your workplaces or your families, people weren't afraid of you fearfully, but they were in awe. They reverenced. They were like, what happened to you? I just called my parents up from Belgium. And they said, boy, what happened to you? And I said, I got saved. And of course, they said, well, we're saved too, but we don't act like you. And of course, in my zeal, I said, because you're not saved like me. I doubt if you're even saved at all. And so you need to get right with God and get saved. And then you'll be like me in your right mind. And I was calling on a pay phone too, brother. I had to pay for this. Up until that point, my mother said, why don't you get a phone? I said, because I got to pay for it. She said, well, how are we going to get in touch with you? I said, you won't. I'll get in touch with you. That was sin, sin, sin. I got saved, got me a phone. So I got to pay to call y'all and get y'all saved now. They probably wish it was the other way around. I wouldn't do it. Amen. Uh, but there was a difference there. Okay. Uh, so he's, they were afraid. They were in awe. They were in reverence. Uh, obviously, uh, before this time. And prior to this, uh, everybody saw him, didn't think anything about it. But now a change happened. When a change happens in our lives, there should be something that happens, as it says here, uh, to uh, uh, cause others to respect us more. Now, that's not going to always be the case. There will be some people that are not going to respect you. I don't care how you dress. There's just some people just don't have no respect for anybody. Uh, but by and large, across the board, Christians should be different. And as a result of our being different, it should go with our Christ-like character, which should make people have more reverence, more awe for us by the way we carry ourselves, like Christ would carry himself, and coupled by the way we dress. Okay, again, there are some people that's not going to have any respect for you because they don't have respect for themselves. And that's, that's how they're going to be. But by and large, that's the way it should be. Uh, so this passage of Scripture here shows uh, basically uh, the, how others respond to change in one man. This is one man. One man's life. The city came out to see what was going on in one man's life. Amen. And I mean, it's powerful to know that, you know, when this guy was possessed, when he was unclothed, uh, God saved him. And now he's clothed in his right mind. And uh, he was let alone in the tombs when he was possessed. Uh, but now he's getting some good attention, some good publicity, if you would. The publicity that he got before was all bad. Now it's all good. They want to see what's going on in his life. Amen. Uh, he's saved. He's clothed. And then he's in his right mind. Amen. By the way, men or women conservatively dressed, whether a man is in a nice suit and ladies in her uh, conservatively modest dress, normally draws uh, respect more so than someone is not, irregardless of how they really are. What am I saying? You give me a, a dope dealer or a drug dealer or a prostitute <coughs> or someone that is less than desirable in their sinful lifestyle, you take them and dress them up and put them out and they will look just as good as the next person. Now, it doesn't say anything about the inward character. But because of their outward character, they are different. Doesn't say beans about how they truly are. But now, there should be something in my character on the inside that comes out just because I'm dressed up doesn't mean anything. Okay, but a person well dressed normally commands more respect than someone that is not. I mean, think about it. You see two people approaching you. One on this side got the sag bag, uh, got uh, chains and gold and jewelry, and uh, you know sneakers are not tied up and look like a gangbanger. And on this side, a man with a briefcase and he's got a tie and a suit, and you've got to walk in between two of those. Which guy are you gonna get closer to? Be honest. Which one would you get closer to? The guy in the suit, because you just assume he must be more respectable by the way he's dressed. We do that naturally. Yes, sir, we do, Pastor. And you saw two ladies coming, one conservatively and modestly dressed, covered up, looking very uh, nice and uh, modest. But then you've got another lady over here looking like a hooker. Uh, which one are you going to go closer to? The one that's nicely dressed. The other one may mug you, amen. If you're a guy, she may try and get you, you know, and uh, trying to get you off to the side somewhere, amen. It's just our nature. That's what we do. We are an appearance people. That's who we are. Amen. So let's look at a few things here on some of these questions here. Uh, the first one, uh, man looks on the outward appearance. People immediately formulate a respect level towards you based on how you're dressed. That's true. Man looks on the outward appearance. People immediately formulate a respect level towards you based on how you're dressed. Now, again, 
It could be wrong as two left shoes, but they still are going to formulate an opinion on you based upon how you're dressed. I, you, you can't get around it, so don't even try. You cannot get around it. I used to work at Red Lobster, and uh, I wore an apron, and I carried a, a little bucket with all my dishes in there, and I walked around. The manager wore a tie, and he wore a shirt like this. If he and I are both standing there, which one commands more respect, him or me? Why? The way I'm dressed. He looks like he's in authority. Now, I've got an apron, no badge, I got a bucket, and I've got a dish rag. He's got a tie and a badge and a shirt. He's going to command more authority based upon he's, the way he's dressed. It's just in our nature to respect the way we dress. So when you look at this question, man looks on the outward appearance, people immediately uh, formulate a respect level towards you based on how you're dressed. Amen. The people in this passage of scripture, they were afraid because of the radical change in this man's life, because of the amazing power of Christ to make one different than what they were before. And that's what the power of God can do in your life and in my life. It makes us radically different because we're radically been changed from the inside out. Now, I'll be honest with you, I didn't change automatically, radically, uh, outwardly when I first got saved. I told y'all how I used to come to church at first. It wasn't until God began to show me principles from the Bible and uh, how my dress would impact people that God began to work in me that, hey, you might need to do something about the way you're dressed. Uh, it, it, it didn't dawn on me before that. Uh, now, the, 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 the scary part about it was, before I got saved, I always wore a tie and, and a jacket when I went to church. The minute I got saved, I said, well, God doesn't see, I, you know, he's looking at the heart. He wants my heart, blah, blah, blah. How many of y'all heard that before? God's looking at my heart. You know, everybody wants to judge me. You don't judge me. It's my heart. God knows my heart. Well, yeah, God knows your heart. And God wants to get to the heart, and the heart should produce the outward change, amen? And so God, as he began to get with my heart, began to change my outward appearance, amen? Yeah, Amy, you going to say something? Amen. And it's true, even in, in the confines of your own house, Amy's saying, uh, how you dress in your own home, it's going gonna, it's gonna to project differently in what you do. It really is. You know, my boys even see it sometimes. When I put on my tie and things like that, they know oftentimes I'm going to church. Sometimes they'll say, Daddy, why you got your tie? You're not going to church. I say, well, I'm going over here. Oh, okay. Oh, Daddy, why are you putting on your polo shirt? You know, where are you going? Well, I'm going over here. Uh, and G2, the first one, Daddy, why don't you have your tie? I did the unthinkable. I packed all my suit and everything up for my, my trip, and I forgot my white shirt. Uh -oh. And so I went looking for, went shopping looking for a shirt. You don't go uh, in touristic places looking for a, a white shirt. They cost too much. And so I bought me a little, little inexpensive polo and, and wore that. And uh, G2 said, Daddy, you don't have a tie on for church. I said, I know, son. It's terrible, isn't it? Amen. I didn't have my tie, I had my jacket on, I had my little polo, and I just felt out of place, you know. And what you know, you go to church, and they say, oh, we got a pastor here. You got to stand up. I'm like, ah. Why you have to go and pick? They ain't got my tie on, amen. You know, you feel just, yeah. And I was so glad that the preacher up there was preaching about time when he forgot his jacket, so I didn't feel so bad. Amen. Uh, but people are going to uh, judge you based upon that. It, uh, it is, whether it's in your home or outside your home, uh, it does do something with you. Amen. Uh, it, it, it's uh, amazing how this clothed man uh, changed these people's perspective of him, the situation, and Christ because of one man. Yeah. One man. They came to Jesus, they saw this man, they said, there's something different here. And uh, he wanted to go back and, uh, and be with Jesus. And Jesus said, you need to go back and, and be with these folk here, amen. So when you look at this, uh, they make a statement here. When you learn how to properly, uh, when, when, you, when you learn how to dress appropriately uh, in honor to the Lord, people who come into contact with you, it says, uh, will respect you more. Now, again, that's not always the case. You still got some dead beasts that are not going to respect you. But oftentimes, that is the case. There's much respect to be gained in dressing right. Uh, some people just aren't going to respect you no matter who you are. Amen. But it's the power of Christ that changed this man's life so quickly. They got everybody's attention. Amen. Uh, any questions before we move on to the next blank here? 
Uh, so basically, the way you dress lead others to respect you more. Looking at this man's life, uh, people immediately formulate a respect level towards you based on how you are dressed. And then that last one, uh, uh, everyone, uh, people who come in contact with you uh, will respect you more. Uh, so that, that's, those are the blanks there. Amen. Questions on that? Amen. They said everyone. I don't agree with everyone because there are some people that don't respect me. Okay, because uh, it, it says that everyone who comes into contact will respect you more. Ah, Some people just don't have respect. And if that were the case, nobody dressed nice would get mugged. Uh, there are some people just don't have respect. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next one here. So the way you dress should lead others to respect you more. Number seven, the way you dress should influence others toward God. Where did the people go that came out to see this man? Jesus. They came to Jesus. So the way you dress should influence others toward God. And you say, preacher, uh, what, what is all about? Again, it's about the heart. This is not surface. This is not about trying to conform the outside. This is about letting God through the Holy Spirit get to your heart. And then because God gets to your heart, it radically changes the outside because you want to draw others to Christ and you want to get a chance to witness to them about why you do. One of my famous illustrations was that we used to come out on visitation all the time. And I really didn't uh, dress, uh, you know, up or anything like that. I would just wear what I had on. And, uh, and then one day, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'll just put on a nice pair of slacks and I put a little sweat, sweater on with collar and, and it went out. And uh, one of the girls from the church actually saw me and she said, Brother Dawson, what are you doing out looking so nice? And it hit me. This was from an 11 year old girl. She said, what are you doing out looking dressed so nice? And from a, out of the mouth of babes, it hit me. Why don't I do this for every soul winning time when I go out? Look presentable. Don't look like I'm going to a ball game. Don't look like I'm going to the gym because that's where I used to look before like I was going to the gym. Had on my sweatpants. I mean, laughing over there. Had my sweatpants on, my sweatshirt. I'm going to tell people about Jesus, you know. You know, and then somebody asked me one time, you going to a game? I, I got insulted. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to no game. What does it look like I'm dressed? Duh. Look like I was going to basketball practice. Why? So when it used to be on basketball nights, and so I guess I was in that rut. <laughs> And so then I had to change, change suits. Amen. Uh, so let's look at a couple uh, verses here. First one is going to be 1 Samuel 16, 7. 1 Samuel 16, 7. And again, this is a fundamental fact that you and I can't get away from, so don't even try. 1 Samuel and, uh, 16 and verse 7. First one there, raise your hands so we can read that. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Go ahead, Rodney. Amen. Now that's true. The Lord looks on the outward, uh, uh, looks on the, the heart. But man does look on the outward appearance. You, that's a fundamental fact. We can't get away from it. Like it or not, even Samuel, God's prophet, who could uh, speak on behalf of God and, and proclaim and project future events, came here to anoint the next king. He immediately thought that the king should be someone like King Saul, head and shoulders above everybody else, some big strapping guy. And he said, boy, this must be the one. Notice what he says here. In verse number, where did he say the, the Lord's anointed is before him? Yeah, verse uh, number 6. It came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Now this is uh, Samuel, the man of God. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. He looks at uh, Eliab and he says, Man, look at that big guy. He looks like Saul. He's built like Saul. He said, Man, look nicely. That must be him. Yes, and God had to say, You're looking at the outside. I am not concerned about how he looks on the outside. I am looking at the heart. And by the way, people can't see your heart. They only see the outside. So it behooves us to make sure that the heart is shown on the outside. And that's the beauty of this because if I, if I am going to do that which is going to be pleasing to God, man can't, we're, we're, we're like Samuel. We look at a person and say, hey, what you see is what you get. If you dress like a thug, you must be a thug. If you dress like a hooker, you must be a hooker. Now, it's not always true. If you dress like a thief, you must be a thief, you know? Uh, I mean, if you dress like you're gothic, you must be gothic, you know? If you dress in all white, you must be an angel. Psych, that's not even true. <laughs> and you get these TV preachers with these white shoes, these white suits, you know, it's like yeah. white shirts, like, ah, I don't even try it, amen. Uh, so when you look at this, amen, he said he's before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance, 
He said, don't look at how he looks on the outside, nor the height of his stature, how big and tall he is. He said, I refused him. Why, Lord? For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So the fundamental fact is God sees the heart. Man does look on the outward appearance. You cannot get away from it. So it behooves us to dress the part. Why? People are going to judge you based upon it anyway. I'd much rather be, uh, be dressed up than to be dressed down and be found guilty of dressing conservative. That's right. Amen. Amen. I, I, I don't want to be associated with a thug in any way, shape, fashion, or form. That's right, That's right. I don't want to be associated with a, a non-desirable right. any way, shape, fashion, or form. I don't want to do that. Uh, so you, you got to watch that, amen. Uh, I used to go into the stores with my cousin. My cousin was a notorious thief. And uh, I would watch people watching us as we went in. And I'd say, man, get away from me. People looking at us. You know, you just look like a criminal. Just go somewhere else. You, you got people looking at me like I'm a criminal, amen. Uh, and now he was a criminal. That's why he's in prison now. Uh, but he just had this way of looking at this and that and the cameras. And, you know, and I'm like, you, you, you're looking obvious like you're trying to steal something. You, you look like a crook. And, uh, and, and, and sure enough, we'd come out, I didn't see him take anything. And we'd get down the road and he said, look at this, Greg. I said, I can't believe you. I can't believe it. I said, man, do you know I could have went to jail with you? I said, don't you ever, don't, don't go to the store with me anymore. I am not going anywhere. Now, we were dressed the same. We looked the same. Everything about us was the same, except being a thief, <laughs> amen. And people looked at us. They looked at our appearance and some of the things that he did. I don't know how he didn't get caught. It must have been pretty bad at what he did, good at what he did. I guess thieves, amen. So you can't get away from this appearance thing here. It's there. Come down to another verse here. Uh, verse uh, 1 Peter 2.12. 1 Peter 2.12. So we see by this verse that you can't get away from that. It, it, it is there. It is there. You can't get away from it. 1 Peter 2.12. Man does look at an outward appearance. So it, it, it is in our best interest to dress the part. 1 Peter 2.12, and uh, if you look at 1 Peter 2.12, get somebody to read that. Who's there? Good works is what we're looking at. Uh, Monique, read that. Amen. By your good works, part of your good works should be the way you dress. Again, I, I should always make it a practice of getting dressed in the morning, looking in the mirror and saying, Lord, what do you think about this? Lord, is this what you would have me to wear today before my husband, before my wife, before my children, uh, before the world at large out there, before my church family, before my coworkers, before my classmates, before uh, my sports mates, before anybody. I should stop and park in front of the mirror and say, Lord, this is your body. You've made this body. Lord, how do you want me to dress this body up that you've given me so that I can be a witness uh, for you today that people might ask me something? I, I notoriously, when I'm here during the weekdays, will wear ties about Jesus. I'm, I'm baiting people. I'm baiting people to ask me a question. And, you know, a, a lot of guys wear ties. But I, I got a tie like Serge. And the lady I went to the store, the other, she said, ooh, I like that. I said, yes, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I, 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 I'm trying to bait them in, amen. If, I don't, if they don't get, catch the bait, amen, I might just hook them on purpose, amen. Do something. Uh, but when you, when you look at this, here's the first question here. Your appearance always influences others. Now mark that down. Your appearance always influences others. I'm talking always, always. It's going to influence them one way or another. To do something or not to do something. To say something or not to say something. To approach or not to approach. Uh, it's going to do something. The way you dress will do, it will give someone some sort of opinion about you. You say, preacher, that's not true. What do you do when you see somebody dressed a certain way? There's, uh, there's, I mean, even in the military, they all wear the same thing. But there are some military guys that theirs is too tight, too small, too big, too long. There are some ladies' uh, military dresses, they're too tight, they're too short. We had a lieutenant, I'll never forget her, Lieutenant Knox. She was shapely and she knew it. And she wore her skirt as tight as she possibly could as close to the line as she possibly could, and she knew it. She wore her shirt as tight as she possibly could, and she was in the military. 
And I was saved. I used to say, I want to go and talk to the commander. You need to tell this woman, she's a section commander in front of the whole squadron. She needs to upsize. You know, her stuff fit her like a sock. I'm like, she, she, no, she, she got to do something about this. She's in here prancing around all these people, and she knew it. So the way we dress always influences others. Now, what did the, the young airmen come in thought about that? They thought, ooh, look at her, look her. What do people think like me? I'm thinking, boy, you must not be thinking very highly of yourself. You are trying to attract too many of the wrong eyes. Amen. So your appearance always influences others one way or another to do something or not to do something, to say something or not to say something, to think something or to not to think something, to approach you or not to approach you appropriately. Again, the saying still goes, some, uh, some have no respect for anybody and they're going to hit on you either way it goes or think of you anyway. Uh, these uh, people have formulated their opinions of our God by how we look. It's just a fact of life. We cannot, we cannot run away from it. Because before they know you're a Christian, they're going to make an assessment about you. Then after they find out you're a Christian, they're going to reassess that first assessment that they made of you. Amen. They're going to look at how you're dressed first, and then when they find out you're a Christian, oh, you're a Christian. I didn't know Christians X, Y, and Z. Or, oh yeah, I knew Christians X, Y, and Z. And you fit the part. Or you don't fit the part. Amen. Why? They look on the outward appearance like Samuel. Okay, here's the next blank here. People judge your appearance and they judge God by your appearance. People judge your appearance and they judge God by your appearance. You say, preacher, no, they don't. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. They certainly do. Any of you that came in here before you got saved, you judged probably every last one of us. Every last one of us. And before you came here, you judged them wherever, you, wherever else you were at. And you judge God by them, amen? Uh, so people judge your appearance, they judge God by your appearance. And then uh, the last blank down there, decide that in your choice of clothing you will be a witness for Christ, not a witness for culture. Decide that in your choice of clothing you will be a witness for Christ, not a witness for culture. And you have to ask yourself the question, do you value your good influence on others more than you value your right to wear wherever you want to wear? Is it more important for you to wear what you want to wear or to be an, an, an impact for Christ? You have to ask that question. What's more important to me? To impact people for Jesus' sake, for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, so people can see Christ in me? Or is it more important for them to see me and what I'm all about? Because what all I'm about, it should be Christ anyway. And I should be wanting to portray him and put him first so that others can see him. Now, are we all going to fall into the trap but just like, uh, like Samuel? Yes. But what we're trying to do is cut down some of the distractions, some of the detractors uh, from how I dress. Again, this is all about a heart issue. God does see the heart, but man does look on the outward appearance. And so it behooves us to make sure that we dress in a way that's going to glorify God. Your verse for next week is going to be Matthew 5, 16, which is an easy verse. It's right down there underneath your lesson, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's our theme verse for the church. So that should be easy. So the way you dress should influence others toward God. That's a fact that we cannot get away from. Your appearance always influences others. This is just a fact of life. People judge your appearance and they judge God by your appearance. Then that last one, decide that in your choice of clothing you will be a witness for Christ, not a witness for culture. You may want to be different on purpose Why we're different by design. So as you leave, I challenge you, ask yourself the question, am I more concerned about what people think or what Christ thinks about how I'm dressed? And it should be what Christ thinks. And so we've got to ask him so that we can be a greater witness and bring others toward him. Just like that maniac, amen. People went out to see what was up with him. Amen. Father, thank you for your goodness. And God, we know that we're at different levels here. and We're at different stages of our Christian walk. And Lord, there may be those like I started off with. It took me a while to change the outward appearance. I was not really cognizant of the fact that people judge my God by how I was dressed. But I pray that there will be some hearts that will catch fire and see that there is a, a direct difference in how they dress and how people see their God. And like the maniac of Gadara, that they would see a difference in the radical change that Christ brings into a life and see us uh, clothed and sitting at the feet of Jesus. Uh, folks may be in awe and in reverence of what impact 
God has made in our lives. Take us now, Lord, into our next session. Uh, bless the refreshments that we have in the back. Use this time uh, to, Lord, help us to fellowship one with another. But Lord, then reflect on the changes that you may possibly want to make within our lives, uh, starting with our heart, then allowing it to reflect outwardly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Matthew 5, 16, our verse for next week. You are dismissed. Refreshments are in the bank.